Okay, <clears throat> so let's begin with the, the first question. On the left hand side of the screen, uh, we will uh, have the question and on the right hand side, we will have the solution. So this question is a comprehensive question which carries 14 marks and uh, information is given on different points in this question and towards the end we are required to compute the total income and the tax payable by Mrs. Nisha for the AY 22-23 and we are supposed to ignore the provisions of section 115 BAC. So the tax is to be uh, computed and the total income also is to be computed as per the regular provisions. So Mrs. Nisha is a resident individual aged 54 years which means she is not a senior citizen. She is carrying on the business of manufacturing of textile fabrics as a proprietor. The turnover in the previous year 2021 is 250 lakh and in the current previous year it is 600 lakh. The net profit as per the profit and loss account as on 31st March 2022 is 5,61,000. She provides the following additional information. Those were not considered, not considered while making the profit and loss account for the previous year 21-22. So we begin with the net profit as per PNL account of 5,61,000, and therefore net profit as per PNL account is 5,61,000. Point number one. <clears throat> Depreciation has not been debited to PNL account and therefore we now need to debit the amount of depreciation. The details of plant and machinery are given as under. 1st April opening written down value is given and on 3rd of July a new machinery has been purchased and payment made by account paycheck 725000 and on 10th of March one machinery has been sold for 75000. She does not have any other fixed assets employed in the business. Point number two is related to this point. Received subsidy of 20% on new machine purchased on 3rd July which is this machine during the previous year under technology upgradation fund scheme from the central government. So less depreciation not considered in PNL account. So now we need to provide for depreciation and we need to compute the closing WDV which is the opening WDV of 4,75,000 plus purchase of 5,80,000 and how did we arrive at 5,80,000? 7,25,000 which is given as the purchase price minus 20% of this amount which is 1,45,000 subsidy and then further the sale of 75,000 is to be reduced which gives us the closing WDV for purpose of computing depreciation of 9,80,000 subsidy is required to be reduced because if we look at the manner of computing actual cost these amounts are to be reduced if they form part of actual cost and subsidy is one of the amounts received from the government used to meet the cost of asset and accordingly the subsidy has been reduced. Now here we have assumed that the purchase value does not exclude subsidy. So what we have assumed here that this purchase value 7,25,000 does not exclude subsidy and therefore we have excluded 25% 20, uh, 20 from, this, from this amount. One alternative view is also possible that the 7,25,000 is after reducing 20% on account of subsidy and in that case no adjustment to this 7,25,000 is required on account of this particular point and the reason is that uh, it is mentioned that payment has been made by account paychecks so one can infer that the payment of 7,25,000 has been made so obviously it could have been made after reducing the amount of subsidy so if this alternative view is taken one should give an appropriate note the view that we have taken is that uh, purchase value does not exclude subsidy and this is what we also need to mention in the note see in ICI questions or generally in uh, most of the questions relating to taxation at several places more than one interpretation of view could be possible in that case we should properly make an assumption uh, give an appropriate note and then accordingly proceed so normal depreciation at 15% of 9,80,000 is 1,47,000 
what we also need to provide is additional depreciation. Why? Because in the question, we have already been told that Mrs. Nisha is engaged in manufacturing business. And if you look at the provisions for additional depreciation, additional depreciation is to be provided to an SSE engaged in manufacture or production. So additional depreciation will be 20% of actual cost of new plant and machinery. And accordingly, additional depreciation is 20% of 5,80,000, which is 1,16,000. Total depreciation to be reduced is 2,63,000. The third point says, she paid job charges for the value addition on the fabrics of Rs. 90,000 without deduction of tax to job worker by an account paycheck. Now this will be treated as a work under section 194C and therefore TDS is to be deducted. But Mrs. Nisha is an individual. An individual needs to deduct TDS under section 194C only if the individual is a specified person. In our case, we are told that the turnover from business of Mrs. Nisha for the preceding year was 250 lakh, which is greater than 1 crore. And therefore, Mrs. Nisha is required to deduct tax. Now, since she has not deducted tax, disallowance will need to be made. And therefore, the disallowance will need to be made under section 40AIA, any sum payable to a resident. And disallowance will be to the extent of 30% of such sum. Now, 90,000 has been paid. 90,000 has been paid and 30%, 27,000 needs to be disallowed and therefore 63,000 needs to be allowed as expenditure. Now here also two approaches are possible. In our case, we have assumed that expense was not debited to PNL account. That means this 90,000 was not debited to PNL account. And accordingly, after disallowing uh, under uh, section 40 AIA, 63,000 have been debited to PNL account and the reason is that in the beginning of the question it has been mentioned that the following information was not considered while making the profit and loss account. So as per one view it is possible to say that this 90,000 itself was not considered in preparing the profit and loss account and so the amount after making the disallowance now needs to be now needs to be allowed as a deduction. The other view is also possible in which case uh, we can say that look 90,000 was debited to PNL account but this adjustment was not considered and therefore uh, 27,000 in that case needs to be added back. So instead of 63,000 which has been reduced 27,000 will need to be added as disallowance. In, in either case one needs to make an appropriate assumption and a note. The next point is number four. Commission paid to one agent, which has allowed, which has been allowed as deduction in earlier assessment year amounting to 50,000, has now been received back during the previous year 21-22 from the agent due to settlement with commission agent. So 50,000 was allowed in an earlier year. It has now been received. So what needs to be done in this respect? So we need to remember section 411, which says that if any Allowance or deduction has been made in respect of any expenditure and subsequently any amount has been obtained, then deemed profits arise and amount obtained or the value of benefit is to be taxed under section 41.1. So accordingly, in our case, we need to add this 41.1 in respect of commission received back, which is rupees 50,000. Next point says 25,000 paid to creditor for goods in cash. Now here we need to keep in mind the provisions of section 40A3 which provides for disallowance of any expenditure where the payment has been made uh, by a non-specified mode which includes cash exceeding rupees 10,000. So the disallowance of the expenditure needs to be made in our case and therefore payment to creditor rupees 25,000 has been disallowed. Now what we have 
here assume just like job charges we have uh, we have assumed that the expense was not debited to PNL account and therefore it need not be debited because of disallowance. Now as per the another approach if we were to say that the amount was debited but this particular point regarding payment in cash was not considered then in that case we need to add back this entire 25,000. Okay so two approaches are possible we have taken the approach that the expense was not debited in the first place and therefore since the disallowance is to be made nothing needs to be allowed as a as a deduction from the PNL. We will come to point number six after some time. Point number seven says interest received amounting to rupees two lakh duly authorized by partnership deed of Mrs. Ramji Textiles at the rate of 15% per annum on the capital employed. She is a sleeping partner in Ramji Textiles. So interest at the rate of 15% per annum of 2 lakh has been received where she is a sleeping partner. Now what we need to consider here are the provisions of section 40b where interest is deductible in the hands of the partnership firm up to 12%. Up to 12% and interest is allowable to the firm as per the above limit to working as well as non-working partner. That means even if she is a sleeping partner, the interest at the rate of 12% will be allowed. Balance 3% will not be allowed. Taxation in the hands of partner. What is allowed to the firm is taxable in the hands of partner under section 28V. So this means that in our case, we need to add The amount under section 28V for interest allowed to the firm at the rate of 12%. So 3% has not been allowed to the firm. We need to ignore that. And 12% of the interest will be 1,60,000. So we need to add it as PGBP income. After making these adjustments, the profit from the manufacturing business comes to 4,45,000. Now let's look at point number six. Incurred loss of 1,17,500 from an eligible transaction carried out in respect of trading in derivatives in a recognized ex stock exchange. Now, since this is a case of, of uh, trading in derivatives, uh, PGBP will apply, capital gain will not apply. Now, we need to see what is the treatment that we should give to the loss. Now, if you look at inter-source adjustment of loss under section 70, if it is a loss from a speculation business, it can only be set off against profits from a speculation business. It cannot be set off against profits of any other business. So what we need to figure out whether the loss in our case is a speculation loss or not. Now, if we look at the meaning of speculative transaction under section 43.5 certain transactions are not deemed to be speculative transactions and one case is trading in derivatives and securities carried out in a recognized stock exchange. So in our case this uh, loss from an eligible transaction carried out in respect of trading in derivatives in a recognized stock exchange will not result in a speculative transaction and therefore this loss is not from a speculative business and accordingly the restriction that we just now noted will not apply and this loss can be set off against the loss from manufacturing business in our case. So we come back to our solution and we set off the derivative loss under section 70 it is not speculative loss so 1,17,500 can be set off which gives us the total PGBP income of 3,27,500. The next point says she received rupees 60,000 by premature withdrawals from deposit, including interest of rupees 5,000 in post office time deposit eligible for deduction under section 80C. So post office time deposit uh, investment was eligible under section 80C 
and then there is a premature withdrawal the withdrawal is of 60000 out of which principal amount is 55000 and interest is rupees 5000 so what should be the treatment in this case so let's look at section 80c and see what happens in section 80c one of the eligible items is 5 year post office time deposit so we need to say that this time deposit was for 5 years and the lock in period is of 5 years and in our case there has been a premature withdrawal that means before completion of 5 years and what is the implication if there is a premature withdrawal if there is a premature withdrawal 5 year POTD post office time deposit if any amount including interest accrued is withdrawn within 5 years then the amount withdrawn is taxed at taxed as income of the current previous year so amount withdrawn is taxed as income but interest already taxed is not taxed again because double taxation needs to be avoided so interest if it has been taxed earlier it will not be taxed once again but the amount of principal which was invested in the earlier years and therefore ATC was claimed ATC will need to be clawed back and therefore the amount withdrawn to that extent will need to be taxed as income of the current previous year so if we look at our case there has been a premature withdrawal and therefore 60,000 minus 5,000 interest already taxed earlier because it would have been taxed on accrual basis 55,000 will need to be clawed back and therefore 55,000 will need to be added as income from other sources next point says she sold her gold bracelet jewelry used by her for personal purposes on 1st may for 5 lakh which was acquired for 40000 on 1st march 2005 a diamond was embedded onto bracelet on 1st may of 50000 and therefore cost inflation index for 2004 5 is 113 and 2007 8 is 129 2021 22 is 317 now what we need to remember is the definition of capital asset because capital gains arise in this case now capital asset does not include personal effects but personal effects exclude jewelry so consequently in our case what has been sold is a capital asset and therefore capital gains will need to be computed so sale of gold bracelet full value of consideration is 5 lakh rupees and cost of uh, acquisition we need to provide indexation 40,000 multiplied by 317 divided by 113 and then uh, we also need to add the index cost of improvement on account of a diamond which was embedded onto the bracelet so this becomes our cost of improvement and here also we need to provide for indexation and finally uh, we need to reduce index cost of acquisition and indexation and long term capital gain under section 112 uh, is arrived at 2,64,920. In the next point, we are told she received a gold coin bullion worth 55,000 FMB from her cousin, daughter of uncle during the previous year 21-22. Now, gold coin bullion is a uh, uh, property it's a capital asset covered under section 56 to x and uh, the fair market value is 55,000 and it was received as a gift from the cousin daughter of uncle now cousin daughter of uncle is not a relative under section 56 to x so the amount will be taxable and since this exceeds 50,000 the entire 55,000 will be taxable and therefore under section 56 2x for gold coin this 55,000 needs to be added under the head income from other income from other sources in the next point <clears throat> we are told that she incurred long term loss from sale of shares of the Indian company STT is paid on the sale and purchase of shares of 75,000 since this is long term and from sale of shares and STT was paid on sale and purchase it's a loss under section 112A long term loss under the head capital gain 
can be set off from long term capital gain under section 112 under section 70 inter source adjustment so 75000 can be set off which gives us the total capital gain amount of 189920 and accordingly we arrive at the gross total income of 627420 okay let's look at last point first she purchased the new residential house during the previous year and paid stamp duty and registration fees 1,55,000 to get transfer of the property in her name. So two items have been paid for residential house. Now we need to see whether this can be allowed under section 80C. So payments for purchase or construction of residential house and one of the items is stamp duty and registration fees. So 80C needs to be allowed in this respect. And accordingly, in our solution, uh, the amount is 1,55,000 but limit under 80C is 1,50,000 so 1,50,000 needs to be allowed. Now nothing is taxable under the head income from house property in our case as this is a self-occupied property and therefore the NAV is nil and we are also not provided any information regarding interest under section 24b so that's why we have done uh, really nothing uh, on account of income from house property because it is not required in our case the last point in this question is she deposited a sum of rupees 50000 with lic of india every year for the maintenance of her mother aged 70 years dependent upon him it should be her and suffering from severe disability so maintenance of a mother aged 70 years, 50,000 is deposited with LIC and mother is suffering from severe disability. Now this should take our attention to the provisions of section 80DD where the SSC Mrs. Nisha is an individual and ex amount has been deposited in approved scheme of LIC for maintenance of dependent and parent is a dependent and uh, therefore deduction under section 80 dd needs to be provided and a flat deduction of rupees 1,25,000 for severe disability will need to be provided even if the expenditure is only 50,000 in our case therefore in our solution we will give deduction of section 1,25,000 and which will give us the total income of 352 Four two zero. Now we need to compute the tax payable as well and we need to ignore the provisions of section 150, 115 BAC. Now for computing tax we need to see what is the composition of the total income. So LTCG under section 112 which we computed earlier LTCG which was this balance amount <clears throat> after setting off the loss under section 112A was 189920. The balance income is 162,500. Now the basic exemption limit in our case is 250,000 and we note that the regular income is less than this basic exemption limit. So unexhausted basic exemption limit is 250 minus 162500. It is 87,500 and therefore LTCG tax on LTCG under section 112 will be at the rate of 20% but it will not be computed on 189920 but it will be computed on the amount which is 189920 minus the unexhausted basic exemption limit which is 102420 and this will be therefore 20% 20,484. Since we have uh, long term capital gain under section 112 if we look at this table 112 then we will note that rebate under section 87a is also to be allowed and we know that rebate is to be allowed to a resident individual whose total income does not exceed 5 lakh and it is lower of tax on total income or rupees 12 lakh or uh, sorry or rupees 12500 and therefore the conditions for allowing rebate in our situation are being satisfied 
because total income doesn't exceed 5 lakhs so rebate of 12,500 will be provided and on the balance we will need to add 4% HEC and tax on total income will accordingly be rupees 8,303. So this brings us to the end of question number one. Let's come to question number two. A. Discuss the liability of tax deduction at source under the Income Tax Act in respect of the following cases with reference to AY 2223. Point number one. We are told that XY, a partnership firm, is selling its product R through the e-commerce platform provided by AB Limited, who is the e-commerce operator AB Limited, created in its books of account the account of XY on 28 February 2022 by a sum of 4,90,000 for the sale of product R made during the month of February 2022. Mr. Rai, who purchased product R through the platform provided by AB Limited, made payment of 60,000 directly to XY on 21st February 2022. Now, in our case, what is relevant are the provisions of Section 194O, where the e commerce operator needs to deduct tax at the rate of 1% of the gross amount of sales or service. Uh, and uh, uh, the payee is a resident e-commerce participant, a person who sells goods or provides services including digital product through e-commerce operators facility or platform. So in our case, these conditions are being satisfied because XY, a partnership firm XY is selling its product are through the e-commerce platform provided by AB Limited who is the e-commerce operator. So AB Limited will need to deduct tax at the rate of 1% under section 194O. But we are also told that payment made by a purchaser directly to e-commerce participant for sale of service facilitated by e-commerce operator is deemed to be amount credited or paid by e-commerce operator to e-commerce participant and is thus included in the gross amount for deducting TDS. Therefore, in our case, TDS under section 194O will be 1% of gross amount of sales which is 5,50,000. Why 5,50,000? Because 4,90,000 plus 60,000 which has been paid by Mr. Rai who is a customer directly to XY because the product R has been purchased by him through the platform provided by AB Limited. So the 60,000 will be added and accordingly the amount will be 5,50,000 and 1% of this will be 5,500. Okay, point number two. So ABC Limited is a producer of natural gas. During the year, it sold natural gas worth 26,50,000 to Messrs. Deep in company, a partnership firm. It also incurred 1,70,000 as freight for the transportation of gas. It raised the invoice and clearly segregated the value of gas as well as transportation charges. So ABC basically supplied natural gas to Deep in company and it uh, separately paid the transporter. But in the invoice, it mentioned both transportation charges and charges for sale of natural gas and it segregated both the values and we are required to figure out the TDS implications here. So two transactions are involved. One is the sale of natural gas and other is the freight which has been paid for transportation of gas. Now freight for transportation of gas uh, is actually covered under section 194C because 194C uh, if you look at 194C here, it uh, refers to carriage of goods or passengers by any mode of transport. But what we need to see is whether TDS will actually be applicable in this respect in our case. So there is a circular number 9 of uh, 2012 which refers uh, to a situation of gas transportation. And if you look at the circular, it says that if the owner or seller of the gas sells as well as transports the gas to the purchaser till the point of delivery where the ownership of gas 
to the purchaser is simultaneously transferred it is a contract of sale and not a contract for carriage of goods under section 194 c now here what is happening in our case is abc has sold natural gas and it has separately paid the transporter and it has raised the invoice in respect of both the charges for sale as well as for transport to deep and company but for deep and company the entire transaction is in the nature of contract of sale right so since it is uh, in the nature of contract of sale as per this circular tds under section 194c would not be attracted in the case of payment made by uh, uh, the purchaser to the owner of seller that means by uh, deep and company to abc to abc limited and the circular further says that the manner of raising the sale bill whether the transportation charges are embedded in the cost of gas or shown separately does not alter the basic nature of the contract which remains essentially a contract for sale and 194c doesn't apply to contract of sale it applies to a works contract hence tds is not applicable on the component of gas transportation charges paid by the purchaser to the owner or seller of gas but the transportation charges paid to a third party in our case the transporter because uh, abc uh, because uh, in our case because in our case uh, the company abc limited has paid the transportation charges to the third party transporter of gas right that will continue to be liable to tds and tds will be deductible on such payment to the third party so let's now come back to our situation no tds will be deducted under section 194c on payment by deep and company to abc limited as it is a contract of sale in accordance with this circular now this was regarding the transportation uh, component what about the component of sale of natural gas now sale and purchase as we know is covered by section 194q in the case of tds and in the case of tcs under section 206c1h but we are just required to figure out the tax implications as regards tds not tcs as per this question so we focus on 194q and 194q is the buyer deep and company required to deduct tax on payment made to seller abc limited in this case no not under section 194q because the amount doesn't exceed the limit of 50 lakh okay this uh, particular point is enough to say that 194q will not apply in this particular situation so no tds under section 194q as sum paid for purchase of goods doesn't exceed rupees 50 lakh however tds under section 194c will apply on payment by abc limited to transporter on 170000 this will be under section 194c third point in this question is abc llp paid job charges to xyz a partnership firm for doing embroidery work on the fabric supplied by abc llp during previous year 21 22 as under and four bills have been raised on these particular dates with these particular amounts now this case is uh, covered under section 194 c and the payment has been uh, made by abc llp Uh, to x y z a partnership firm so payment has been made by llp to partnership firm and therefore 194c applies in 194c we need to note that tds is to be deducted only where amount is greater than 30000 in a single payment however this limit is not applicable if the aggregate amount for the financial year is greater than 1 lakh rupees so in a single payment the amount should be more than 30000 and the aggregate for the financial year should be more than rupees 1 lakh and in that case uh, the rate of tds will be 2% because uh, it's not a case of individual or huf so the rate of tds will be 2% so if we look at our uh, question four bills have been raised and uh, therefore tds under 194c will apply as it is a work because work includes supplying a product according to the requirement or specification of a customer by using material purchased from 
such customer or supplied by such customer. So bill number one, bill number one is for twenty seven thousand and therefore no TDS as amount doesn't exceed thirty thousand in a single payment. Similarly for the bill number fifty seven and bill number one zero five because till these three payments the aggregate amount also is not exceeding one lakh rupees. Now in the case of bill number one fifty one, TDS is to be deducted because the amount exceeds thirty thousand. It is thirty two. Thousand, but will TDS apply on thirty-two thousand only, or will the TDS apply on the aggregate of all these payments? In this case, the TDS uh, will apply because the amount is greater than thirty thousand in a single payment, and also aggregate amount for financial year is greater than one lakh. So TDS at the rate of two percent will apply on the entire amount, which is the aggregate of one lakh twelve thousand, and therefore the TDS will be two thousand two hundred and forty rupees in this case. Okay. The next question, Mr. Harsh furnishes the following details for the year ended on 31st March, 2022, and these are the particulars of some incomes and losses, and uh, we need to compute the total income and show the items eligible for carry forward of Mr. Harsh for the AY 22-23. So let's look at how the treatment will be done. Salary received from partnership firm, the same was allowed to the firm. Since the same is allowed to the firm, to that extent, uh, the amount will be taxed under the head PGBP uh, under Section 28B, and therefore PGBP salary from partnership firm eight lakh fifty thousand rupees. Now, loss on sale of shares listed in stock exchange held for eighteen months, and the STT paid on sale. And acquisition. So listed shares, STT paid on sale and acquisition, and it's long term, and therefore there is long term capital loss of six lakh rupees. And on the other hand, there is long term capital gain on sale of land under section hundred and twelve of five lakh rupees. And therefore, under the head capital gain, long term capital gain on sale of land under section hundred and twelve five lakh, and long term loss. Capital loss under Section 112A on sale of shares can be set off. This is inter-source uh, 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 set off under Section 70, and therefore five lakh will be set off. Capital gain will be nil, and the unabsorbed uh, loss of one lakh under 112A will be carried forward under Section 74. Next point says brought forward business loss of AY two thousand fourteen fifteen. Now business loss brought forward business loss uh, can be set off, can be carried forward to assessment year twenty two twenty three because eight years is the time period and twenty two twenty three is actually the last year from two thousand fifteen sixteen. So the six lakh the six lakh brought forward business loss. Can be set off, you know, against the PGBP income, which was salary from partnership firm, which takes the balance to two lakh fifty thousand in respect of PGBP. Now, loss of specified business covered in section thirty five AD three lakh fifty thousand. Now, this cannot be set off because thirty five AD loss can be set off only against uh, specified business uh, profit of specified business under section thirty five AD, and therefore it needs to be carried. Forward and so three lakh fifty thousand needs to be carried forward. Loss from house property is two lakh fifty thousand. Now house property loss can be set off against uh, uh, PGBP income, and the limit of set off is only up to two lakh rupees. So two lakh is set off, and uh, which uh, so uh, the PGBP income balance was two lakh fifty, and after set off of two lakh, the PGBP balance is. Fifty thousand rupees house property unabsorbed house property loss of fifty thousand will be carried forward under section seventy one b. Income from betting gross gross income is included in the total income, not the net income after deduction of tax assessed. So income from betting is fifty thousand, and this income uh, needs to be included in the total income, and no loss can be set off against winning. So fifty thousand is included here. Loss from card games is thirty-five thousand. Now this is basically a debt loss because this loss cannot be set off and it also cannot be carried forward. So fifty thousand becomes income from other sources. We don't have any capital gain, 
and the final PGBP income is 50,000. So total income is 1 lakh rupees and uh, uh, 3 uh, loss items need to be carried forward. 35 AD uh, loss, unabsorbed house property loss and unabsorbed 112 way loss. Question number C. Mr. Sarthak is a member of HUF. It consists of himself, his wife Juhi and his major son Arjun and his minor daughter Aditi. Mr. Sarthak transferred his house property acquired through his personal income to the HUF without any consideration. On 1st October 2021, HUF is partitioned and such property being divided equally. Net annual value of the property for the previous year 21-22 is 1 lakh. Determine the tax implications. So here is a member of HUF who gifted the property to HUF and on 1st of October the HUF is partitioned and the property is divided equally. So what are the tax implications? So on transfer by Sarthak to HUF without consideration, no capital gain will arise by virtue of section 47.3i. Right? So at the time when Sarthak gifted the property to HUF, Sarthak will not be liable uh, to pay tax on capital gain. Similarly, when the HUF distributes the assets on its partition, no capital gain will arise under section 47i. Now in terms of uh, partition, uh, <clears throat> what will be the tax treatment? And in such case, we need to basically look at the provisions of section 64.2. And in such case, uh, tax treatment before partition and tax treatment after partition is to be considered. Before partition, income from property is taxable in the hands of the individual, not HUF. That means in the hands of Sarthak. After partition, income from property received by self and spouse is to be taxed, taxed in the hands of individual, that is Sarthak. And uh, that received by others is to be taxed in the hands of respective persons. However, as far as others are concerned, if the if uh, uh, the income arises to a minor child, then it will be clubbed in the hands of the individual in terms of section 641a after giving the exemption and of sec of rupees 1500 under section 1032. So let's see what uh, uh, happens in our case. Now. Tax treatment after partition, clubbing under section 64.2 and before partition, no clubbing, uh, the clubbing will be done in the hands of uh, Sarthak to the full extent. Uh, now what will be the income from house property? Now the NAV is said to be 1 lakh and therefore this is not income from house property but we need to give 30% standard deduction and income from house property will then be rupees 75,000. Now the partition happens from 1st October but till 30th of September uh, the entire income that is before partition will be taxed in the hands of Sarthak. That means half of this 35,000. Now after 1st October this 35,000 which is the balance it will need to be distributed equally amongst the four persons Sarthak, his spouse, his minor daughter and his major son. The income to be received by self and spouse will be taxed in the hands of uh, Sarthak. So 8750 and 8750 will be taxable in the hands of Sarthak. As far as minor daughter is concerned, 7250 will be taxed, which is after giving exemption of 1500 under section 1032. And as far as major son is concerned, it uh, will be taxed in the hands of major son. It will not be taxed in the hands of Sarthak. So, Total income taxable for Sarthak will be 35,000 plus these amounts which will amount to 59,750 and taxable for Major Son who is Arjun will be the amount of 8750. Question number 3a. Mr. Lalit, a dealer in shares and securities has entered into following transactions during the previous year 21-22 and in this question we are asked to compute the income not the total income chargeable under the head IFOS and capital gains. So we are required to focus only on two heads of income and compute the income under these two heads. So let's see. The first transaction is received a motor car of 5 lakh as gift from his friend. 
Sunil on the occasion of his marriage anniversary. This will not be included as income by virtue of section 56 2x because motor car is not a mobile property which is specified in this list. In our case, motor car received from friend is not a property specified and therefore nothing will be taxable on this count. Second transaction, cash gift of 21,000 each from his four friends. That means friends are not relatives and 21,000 each that means 84,000 has been received in all and it's a cash gift. Therefore, the aggregate is greater than 50,000 and therefore the aggregate sum which is 84,000 will be taxable in our case. So cash gift from friends 84,000 will be taxed. Third point, land at Jaipur on 1st July 2021 as a gift from his friend Cabra. The stamp duty value is 6 lakh as on this date that means of on 1st of July. The land was acquired by Mr. Kavra in the previous year 2001-2002 for rupees 2 lakh and down under we are also given the cost inflation index for 2001-2002 and 21-22 respectively. So we are given this cost inflation index amounts as well. Now land has been received as a gift and stamp duty value is rupees 6 lakh as on this date. So in this case a land has been received without consideration and SDV is greater than 50,000 and therefore SDV is taxable. It's to be included under section 56 2x. Straight away rupees 6 lakh is to be in included and the cost inflation index amounts are given in this question only to create confusion in our mind. These are actually not relevant for our purpose. Mr. Lalit purchased from his friend. Mr. Abhishek, who is also a dealer in shares, 1000 shares of ABC Limited at 400 rupees each on 19th June 2021, the fair market value of which was 600 each on that date. Mr. Lalit sold these shares in the course of his business on 23rd June 2021. Now there are two transactions, one is of purchase and the other is of sale. Uh, as far as purchase from his friend is concerned, Mr. Lalit purchased these shares in the course of his business because he is a dealer in shares and <coughs> sorry, he is a dealer in shares and securities and therefore shares will not be a capital asset in his hands but stock in trade because 56.2x only applies in the case of capital asset. Shares and securities are covered, but these should be capital asset in the hands of the receiver. Since that is not the case, it's a stock and trade and therefore the treatment will be given under the head PGBP. Similarly, on sale of these shares, capital gain will not arise because since sale is in the course of his business, the sale will also be covered under PGBP and we are not concerned with computing income under the head PGBP. Therefore, there is no impact either on IFOS head or under the capital gain head. So we can ignore this point. There is no impact and then we move forward. Further on 1st November 2021, Mr. Lalit took possession of his residential house booked by him two years back at 20 lakh. So the booking amount that means the purchase amount was rupees 20 lakh. The stamp duty value of the property as on 1st November that is on the date of possession or registration was rupees 32 lakh and on the date of booking was 24 lakh. He paid 1 lakh by account pay check as down payment on the date of booking. Now if we again look at the provisions of section 56 2x here is a case where a building which is a capital asset has been received for inadequate consideration and uh, we need to see whether anything will be included in the income under section 56 2x so it will be included if excess which is sdv minus consideration is greater than 50000 and sdv is greater than 110% of consideration if these two conditions are fulfilled then the excess will be taxable under section 56 2x 
and in this case uh, we can take the SDV as on the date of booking at rupees 24 lakh instead of uh, the SDV as on the date of possession or or uh, the registration being 32 lakh because the amount on the date of booking that means the date of agreement has been paid by a specified mode which is a account pay check and now we need to see whether the conditions are satisfied or not for taxability under section 56 2x so the amount will be taxable under section 56 2x as the excess which is SDV of 24 lakh and this is what we are considering as the SDV on the date of agreement minus consideration of 20 lakh which is the excess of 4 lakh is greater than 50,000 so excess is greater than 50,000 an SDV of 24 lakh is greater than 110% of 20 lakh which is 22 lakh therefore the excess is taxable which is the amount of 4 lakh an SDV on the date of booking is taken as part consideration has been received by account paycheck on, on that date so this will be the treatment and rupees 4 lakh will be taxable under the head IFOS under section 56 2x we are further told that he received a shop that is building of the fair market value of 150000 and cash of 50000 in distribution from abc private limited at the time of liquidation process of the company in proportion of his share capital so in proportion of his share capital at the time of liquidation of abc private limited he received a shop of this fair market value and he received money which is cash of 50000 balance in general reserve of the company attributable to his share is 1,25,000 so attributable to his shareholding his share in the general reserve is 1,25,000 now what we need to consider here are the provisions of the definition of dividend under section 222 and 222c is relating to distribution to shareholders on liquidation and this is treated as dividend to the extent of accumulated profit whether capitalized or not in our case we are told that his share in the general reserve is 1,25,000 now this amount obviously would be distributed and this is to the extent of accumulated profit his share attributable to his share so 1,25,000 is to be treated as dividend under section 222c and sorry this is an error this will be not 5 lakh but 1 lakh 25,000 and consequently this will also need to change there is section 46 also which specifically deals with the distribution on account of liquidation and uh, distribution of assets to shareholders on liquidation where in the hands of company there is no capital gain and in the hands of shareholders there is dividend under section 222c which we have already covered and then there is this capital gain but one view is that since Mr. Lalith is a dealer in shares and securities this particular uh, transaction may be covered under the head PGVP and since we are not required to deal with the head PGVP we can ignore this point so we leave it at 222c and then we move to the next point the last transaction is on 1st march 2022 he sold the plot of land at jaipur for rupees 8 lakh so earlier we had covered this point because the land at jaipur was gifted from his friend and the sdv was 6 lakh and we had included this 6 lakh uh, under section 56 2x so this is the amount that we had included now this land has been sold now what will be the tax implication on this count we need to again go back to section 56 2 and then see what happens so here is a table which gives uh, a snapshot of the treatment which needs to be done in such cases now if you see here is an example uh, so in our case you know mr cabra had transferred the land or gifted the land to Mr. Lalit. So Mr. Kavra is basically C and Mr. Lalit is basically C. So B gifted the land uh, to C, right? And therefore there was no 
capital gain in the hands of B by virtue of section 47.3i. Now C, which is Mr. Lilit, when he acquired it from B, which is Kavra, uh, 56 2x applied and that's why we had added 6 lakh under this section uh, as IFOS. Now when C, which is uh, Mr. Lilit, transfers it to D, who is uh, the buyer in this case, then capital gain will arise in the hands of Mr. Lalit, right? And this is a case where <clears throat> this is a case where 56 2x had applied before and now this is a case of sale because Mr. Lalit is selling the land. So here we need to check the provisions of section 50c but it's not relevant here because we don't have any further information in the question on this count. Cost of acquisition in this case will be the value of property taken into account under section 56.2x. Now this was rupees 6 lakh. So this will become the cost of acquisition in our case. Period of holding in our case will be period of holding of C which is Mr. Lalit not B. So the earlier period of holding of Mr. Cabra will not be included and the period of holding of Mr. Lalit will be taken and accordingly long term capital gain or short term capital gain will arise as per the period of holding. So let's look at our solution now. Now sale of plot at Jaipur full value of consideration is 8 lakh rupees less cost of acquisition under section 49.4 this is the value of property taken into account under section 56.2x which is 6 lakh which we had taken here before and short term capital gain will arise because period of holding in the case of Mr. Lalit is not more than 24 months. Uh, period of holding of Mr. Lalit is taken and of Mr. Kavara is not included and therefore STCG short term capital gain of rupees 2 lakh will will arise and therefore the capital gain income will be 2 lakh rupees. We have already discussed that sale of shares purchased from Mr. Abhishek will not be treated under capital gain because it's PGBP and again in the case of liquidation we said that one view could be to treat that as PGBP. So income uh, under the head capital gain would be 2 lakh and income under the head IFOS we have already computed. This is part B. Mrs. Shruti is an Indian citizen is currently in employment with an overseas company located in UAE. During the previous year 21-22, she comes to India for 157 days. She is in India for 200 days, 100 days, 76 days and 45 days in the preceding four financial years. Her annual income for the previous year 21-22 is as follows. And then we have been asked to determine the residential status of Mrs. Shruti for the AY 22-23. Now see she is a Indian citizen and she has come on a visit and her stay in the current year is 157 days and this these are the days of presence in the preceding four previous years and then we have the details of her annual income as well. Now we know that the steps to follow to determine the residential status are that first of all we need to check whether a special rule applies or not and if not then we need to move to the general rule and finally we need to move to the stateless rule. So first we need to check whether any special rule applies or not. These are the special rules. Ship crew rule is not applicable in our case. Employment rule is also not applicable because she doesn't leave India for the purpose of employment. She is already employed abroad. Visit rule and visit and income rule we need to explore. Now these rules are applicable where a citizen of India comes on a visit to India in the previous year this is satisfied and having total income other than income from foreign sources. Now that can either be up to 15 lakh for visit rule which is this rule the first rule and greater than 15 lakh in the previous year. Right, So we need to figure out uh, what will be the total income which is, which is other than income from foreign sources. If this is up to 15 lakh then the visit rule applies and then we need to say whether the stay was 182 days or more which is not our case because the stay in the current year is only 157 days. If 
this total income which is other than income from foreign sources is greater than 15 lakh then visit and income rule will apply and then we need to see whether the person is in India for greater than 120 days in the previous year which is our case because the stay in current year is 157 days and is in India for 365 days or more in the preceding four years which is also uh, satisfied in our case the preceding four years stays 200 plus 100 this is 300 376 plus 45 which is 421 days so if the stay in India is less than 182 days then under this rule the person would become RNOR the person would become resident and then the person would be treated as RNOR under the visit and income rule. So the crux is basically to first determine what is the total income which is other than the income from foreign sources. Now if we talk about this particular aspect, we are told that income from foreign sources is income which accrues or arises outside India. Okay but not being income derived from a business controlled in or profession set up in India. That means even if the income accrues or arises outside India, it will not be considered as foreign income if the business even though run outside India is controlled in India or a profession though run outside India is set up in India. This foreign source income does not include income which is deemed to accrue or arise in India because obviously if it, is, if it accrues or arises in India uh, it uh, will have a good nexus with India and therefore it will not be considered part of income from foreign sources. Okay, so see stay in the current previous year is 157 days, stay in preceding 4 years is 421 days. We have already considered the scope of income from foreign sources and now we see what will be the position. So the first item of income is income from salary earned and received in UAE and uh, this accrues or arises outside India and therefore it will be income from foreign sources. This is income from foreign sources and this is income which is other than income from foreign sources. Second is income earned and received from a house property situated in UAE. This is uh, also income which accrues or arises outside India so this will be income from foreign sources. Income deemed to be accrued and arisen in India because foreign sources income doesn't include income which is uh, deemed to accrue or arise in India it will be not considered as income from foreign sources. Fourth is income from retail business accrued and received outside India but controlled from India. So the business is controlled from India and if the business is controlled from or controlled in India it will not be considered as foreign income. So therefore we put 10 lakh here. Income accrued and arises in India it obviously won't be foreign income, foreign source income and therefore we put it here. So the total of this is 7 lakh, the total of this is 18 lakh and we are told that life insurance premium has been paid by check in India 1 lakh 50 thousand. So to determine the total income we provide deduction under section ATC of 1 lakh 50 thousand. Therefore income from foreign sources is 7 lakh and total income which is other than income from foreign sources is 16 lakh 50 thousand. Now the 16 lakh 50 thousand which is total income other than income from foreign sources is more than 15 lakh. And as we discussed in the chart related to visit and income rule, Mrs. Shruti is a citizen of India. She comes on a visit to India in the previous year 21-22 and has total income other than income from foreign sources greater than 15 lakh in the previous year. She is in India for at least 120, day, 120 days, 120 days or more because it's 157 days in her case and is in India for 365 days or more in the preceding four previous years. She is for 421 days. She is in India for less than 182 days in the previous year, right? And hence she is a resident and not ordinarily resident RNOR under the visit and income rule. Her residential status is RNOR. Let's look at the next question. The SSC is found to be the owner of gold, market value of which is 50 lakh during the financial year ending 31st March 2022 but he recorded to have spent 
only rupees 10 lakh in acquiring the same explain how the assessing officer will deal with the issue now we need to consider the provisions of section 69b in this case which says that where in any financial year the SSE has made investments or is found to be the owner of any bullion that means gold in our case and the AO finds that the amount spent thereon exceeds the amount recorded right so the amount which is found is uh, 50 lakh and the amount which is recorded is only 10 lakh so <clears throat> there is an excess in the books of account and the SSE offers no or unsatisfactory explanation about such excess amount <clears throat> then the excess amount may be deemed to be the income of the SSE for such financial year. So this is how the SSE, how the assessing officer will, will treat. So if there is no or unsatisfactory explanation forthcoming, then the excess amount can be deemed to be the income of the SSE for such financial year under section 69B. And if section 69B applies, then the taxation will happen under section 115 BBE in respect of section 69b where the rate of tax will be 60%, rate of surcharge will be 25% and rate of uh, HEC will uh, be 4%. <clears throat> so now look at how to deal with this in our question. So in our question we have deemed income under section 69b 50 lakh minus 10 lakh the excess of 40 lakh and tax will be levied under section 115 BBE which is 60% of this is 24 lakh and then we add 25% sur surcharge and 4% of HEC and the final tax comes to 31 lakh 20 thousand under section 69B read with section 115 BBE. So this is question 4A. From the following particulars furnished by Mr. Suresh aged 53 years so he is not a senior citizen. A resident Indian for the previous year ended 31st March 2022, you are requested to compute his total income, number one, and number two, tax payable, assuming he does not opt for section 115 BAC. So the first point, we are told that he sold his vacant land on 9th December 2021 for rupees 15 lakh and stamp duty value of land at the time of transfer was 19 lakh. The fair market value of the land on 1st April 2001 was rupees 6 lakh on which date the SDV was rupees 5 lakh. This land was acquired by him on 5th August 1996 for 3.4 lakh and he had incurred registration expenses of 15,000 at that time. The cost inflation index for 21-22 and 2001-2002 are 307 and 100 respectively. So he sold the land on uh, uh, for 15 lakh on which they, the stamp duty value was rupees 19 lakh. So capital gains will arise and full value of consideration will need to be determined under section 50C. Since the stamp duty value is more than 110% of consideration, 100, uh, stamp duty value will be taken as the full value of consideration. So 19 lakh will be taken as the full value of consideration for this purpose. We will have to reduce the indexed cost of acquisition for this purpose. So cost of acquisition multiplied by 317 divided by 100 which are the cost inflation index numbers. Cost of acquisition will be, now when we determine the cost of acquisition, we need to note that in case of asset acquired before 1st April 2001, the cost of acquisition is higher of the actual cost or the fair market value on this date. However, in case of land or building, fair market value cannot exceed the stamp duty value on this date. So accordingly, in our situation, the cost of acquisition will be higher of the actual cost which is 3,55,000. 3,55,000 as 3,40,000 is the acquisition cost of land and uh, you add the registration expenses of 15,000 so 3.55 so 3,55,000 higher of 3,55,000 or fair market value of 6 lakh however it can't exceed the stamp duty value on this date which is 5 lakh so higher of 3,55,000 or 5 lakh becomes 5 lakh 
and we apply the cost inflation index and this becomes our index cost of acquisition and finally the long term capital gain which is 100 uh, which is under section 112 becomes 3 lakh 15000 rupees next point He owns an industrial undertaking established in a SCZ and which had commenced operation during the financial year 2019-20. Total turnover of the undertaking was 300 lakh which includes 1 lakh 120 lakh from export turnover. This industrial undertaking fulfills all the conditions of section 10AA of the Income Tax Act. Profit from this industrial undertaking is rupees 30 lakh. So, This means we need to look at the provisions of section 10 AA in our case. 10 AA deduction will be available and uh, since the current assessment year falls within the first 5 years from the date in which, uh, uh, in which the undertaking commenced operations which is 2019 20 100% of profits derived from export will be allowed as the deduction under section 10 AA. So 100% of profits derived from export. This means profits of the business of the unit multiplied by export turnover divided by total turnover. 100% of this will be allowed as deduction under section 10 AA. And how is deduction under section 10 AA allowed? Deduction is to be allowed from the total income of the SSE computed under the act before giving effect to this deduction and deduction shall not exceed such total income. So first we compute total income and after that we allow deduction under section 10 AA. So the profit from the undertaking is 3 lakh rupees. So we include this under the head, uh, sorry it's 30 lakh rupees. So we include this under the head PGBP. And then we will uh, uh, come to this deduction under section 10 AA slightly at a later point of time when we come to that stage. But before that, let's move to the next point first. He has income of 10,000 from crossword puzzles and 15,000 gross interest from bank fixed deposit. So income from other sources, interest from bank fixed deposit and crossword puzzles we add and this becomes our income from other sources. And finally, we arrive at the gross total income and uh, then we move to our next point. In the next point, we are told that he has paid tuition fees of 36,000 for his three children to a school, the fee being 12,000 per annum per child. We know that deduction under section 80C can be claimed up to any two children. So since it's 12,000 per annum per child for two children, we can claim deduction of 24,000 and therefore total income is 33 lakh. 16,000 and now we give deduction under section 10 AA as financial year 21 22 is within five year period from the year the undertaking commenced operation deduction is of 100% is profit of 30 lakh divided by export turnover um, sorry 30 lakh multiplied by export turnover divided by total turnover and this is 12 lakh and therefore total income comes to 21 lakh 16,000. Now we need to compute the tax payable. So first we will compute the tax liability or say the tax payable as per the regular provisions. Now actually tax liability and uh, tax payable will remain the same because the TDS would not have been deducted on crossword puzzles which is 10,000 because uh, the amount of 10,000 doesn't exceed the threshold of 10,000 for the purpose of TDS under section 194B and similarly for bank FD the threshold is 40,000 and it doesn't exceed so we don't need to worry about the TDS on this count as well under section 194 and consequently tax liability will be the same as tax payable because we don't have any further information regarding either advanced tax or TDS or TCS given in the question. So. Computation of tax. So first tax under section 115 BB will need to be computed on income from crossword puzzles of 10,000 at 30%. So this becomes 3,000. Then tax under section 112, which is a long-term capital gain on 3,15,000 at the rate of 20%. 
and then tax at regular rates on the balance income which is this amount and total is this and we add 4% HEC and then 432432 becomes the tax as per the regular provisions. Now this is not the end of the story because what we need to remember is that the SSE has taken deduction under section 10 AA as well and therefore there is another provision which we need to consider and this provision is alternate minimum tax AMT under section 115 JC 215 JF and when is this applicable SSE is a person other than a company which is individual in our case he has claimed any deduction under section 10 AA adjusted, adjusted total income ATI is greater than 20 lakh we will figure this out and he has not exercised option under section 115 BAC this is what we know so what we need to figure out is see this condition is satisfied this condition is satisfied we need to figure out whether this condition is satisfied or not for that we need to figure out the adjusted total income and adjusted total income will be we will need to pick up the total income and add deduction claimed under, under section 10 AA and that will bring us to adjusted total income and if this is more than 20 lakh rupees then we will need to compare regular tax with AMT right and AMT will be 18 and a half percent of ATI plus surcharge plus HEC and then if regular tax is less than AMT right or that means if uh, if uh, AMT is uh, equal to a more than the, red, the regular tax then ATI adjusted total income will be deemed to be the total income okay and AMT will be the tax liability and since ATI is deemed to be the total income crossword puzzle uh, long term gain etc all that will get assimilated in that uh, adjusted total income which is deemed to be the total income so note separate special rates will apply but the entire AMT will be computed at 18.5% plus HC plus HEC and then AMT will become the tax liability and AMT credit which is the excess of AMT over the regular tax will be allowed to be carried forward to the subsequent year. So with these provisions in mind let's look at our question and see what is the position. So we have figured out the regular tax liability at this amount and now we need to see what happens under AMT. So adjusted total income will be total income which we which is this 21 lakh 16,000 plus 10 double A deduction which we allowed and this comes to 33 lakh 16,000. Now since this is greater than 20 lakh and 10 double A has been claimed and 115 BAC is not opted for AMT is applicable. Consequently AMT is 18.5 percent and then we add 4% of HEC and AMT liability is 637998 and it, since it's more than the regular tax AMT payable will be 637998 and AMT credit to be carried forward will be the difference of 205566 and as we talked uh, you know some time before also tax payable will be the same as tax liability since no TDS has been deducted on crossword puzzles under section 194b as winning doesn't exceed 10,000 and no TDS has been deducted on FD interest under section 194a as it does not exceed 40,000. So our total income will be <coughs> uh, 21,60,000 but actually adjusted total income will be deemed to be the total income. So the total income actually under AMT provisions will be 33,16,000 on which the tax payable will be 637998 which with AMT credit of 205566 to be carried forward to the subsequent year. Next question. Mr. Cabra is engaged in the <clears throat> in the business of growing and curing that is further processing of coffee in the state of Karnataka. The whole of coffee grown in his plantation is cured. Relevant information pertaining to the year ended 31st March 22 are given here under opening balance of car, opening balance of machinery, expenses, in growing coffee, expenses of curing coffee and sale value of cured coffee. The car is used for agricultural operations and the machine was used for coffee curing business operations. We are supposed to compute the income arising from the above activities for the AY 22-23 and 
the written down value as on 1st April 2022. That is WDB as on 31st March minus depreciation for previous year 21-22. We need to consider the provisions of rule 7b in this case. Income from sale of coffee grown and cured by the seller in India is a composite income of which 25% will be considered to be business income and 75% will be considered to be the agricultural income. Agricultural income will be exempt under section 10.1 while business income will be included in the total income for the purpose of taxation. In our case, sale value of cured coffee is 22 lakh and then we reduce the expenses in growing and curing coffee and then we also reduce the amount of depreciation 15% on car and 15% on machinery and then we come to this 13 lakh 20 thousand which is the composite income 75% is agricultural income sorry this is rule 7b this is not rule 8 but 7b so agricultural income is 75% and uh, which is exempt and business income is 25% which is 3 lakh 30 thousand so this will be the income arising from these activities now regarding written down value uh, <clears throat> car opening was 3 lakh and then we reduce the whole of depreciation and then this becomes the written opening written down value of the next year which is 2 lakh 55 thousand similarly for machinery 15 lakh minus 2 lakh 25 thousand the whole of depreciation and the opening WDB for the next year becomes 12 lakh 75 thousand but should this really be the case because only 25 percent only 25 percent of uh, the composite income has been brought to tax that means the effective depreciation that has been allowed is only 25 percent not the entire 100 percent now should we not just reduce the effective depreciation of 25 percent not the whole of 45,000 or 225,000 with the result that the opening WDV of the next year will be much higher than this amount that we have computed. So the question is should the whole of depreciation be reduced or just the effective depreciation that has been allowed to the extent of 25%. Now what should be the, the position in this case? So in this case what we need to consider is the provision <coughs> of section 43.6 in the case of composite agricultural income. Now this provision says that in case of composite agricultural income for computing WDV of assets total amount of depreciation is to be reduced as if the entire income was taxable business income not just the portion of depreciation in our case 25% attributable to income taxable as business income even if the total depreciation has not been actually allowed in our case only 25% has effectively been allowed. Right. So, in view of this express provision, it becomes clear that the whole of depreciation of 45,000 and 2 lakh 25,000 needs to be reduced and this is the correct amount of opening WDV of the next year and uh, we don't need to reduce just the 25% of this and 25% of this. Question number C. So explain with brief reasons whether the return of income can be revised under section 139.5 of the Income Tax Act in the following cases. 1. Belated return filed under section 139.4. So we need to move to the provisions of revised return and see. So revised return section 139.5 and this is the time limit. The question is whether a belated return filed under section 139.4 can be revised. Yes, it can be revised. So even if a belated return is filed, it can be revised provided the time limit of section 139.5, which is uh, actually before the earlier of three months prior to the end of the, assess of the relevant assessment year. That means 31st December of the assessment year or completion of assessment, whichever is earlier. So this is the time limit subject to that compliance. A belated return under section 139.4 can be revised. Second point is return already revised twice under section 139.5. So <clears throat> there is no condition that a return can be revised only once or twice or thrice. The return already revised twice 
also can be revised so there is no prohibition under section 1395 provided there is compliance of the time limit under section 1395 return of loss filed under section 1393 return of loss under section 1393 can be revised if filed within the time allowed under section 1391 because return of loss filed under section 1391 is treated as a return under section 1391 itself and therefore return of loss under section 1393 can also be revised next part due to some inconsistent information provided in the return of income furnished under section 1391 the assessing officer considers it defective under section 1399 and there are three questions and therefore we need to look at the provisions of section 1399 and then figure out what will be the answer so the return is considered to be defective under section 1399 and the first point is how assessing officer for deal with this issue so in case the ao considers that the return is defective he may intimate the defect to the ssc and give him an opportunity to rectify the defect within 15 days from the date of such intimation and ao can also allow extension beyond 15 days on an application made by the ssc so this is how the ao is supposed to deal with the issue second what are the consequences if defect is not rectified within the time allowed so the consequences failure to failure to rectify if the defect is not rectified within the time period allowed the return is treated as invalid and provisions of the act apply as if the ssc had failed to furnish the return in the first place third point specify the remedies available if not rectified within time allowed by the assessing officer late rectification can be made if the ssc rectifies the defect after the expiry of the period allowed but before the assessment is made ao may so it's not compulsory on ao it is on the discretion of the ao ao may condone the delay and treat the return as a valid return let's move to the indirect tax section question number 5 zion limited a gst registered supplier located in ranchi jharkhand is engaged in the manufacturing of washing machines and mixer grinders it provides the details of various activities undertaken during the month of september 2021 as follows and the details are given in the question so we are given the details of outward supplies and purchase of raw material <clears throat> in point number 2 point number 3 we have purchase of a bus and then the rates of gst are given opening balances are given and then we are told that all the figures are exclusive of taxes both inward and outward supplies within the state of jharkhand are to be considered interstate and outside are interstate and all the other conditions for itc have been fulfilled and we need to compute the amount of net minimum gst payable in cash by zion limited for september 2021 so we have first told outward supplies within interstate and outside interstate are 24 lakh and 5 lakh respectively so within and outside 24 lakh and 5 lakh and uh, the rate on washing machines and mixer grinders is 9% 9% and 18% so accordingly we compute igst at 18% cgst and sgst at 9% so this becomes our total output tax liability next we are told that there is a purchase of raw material from registered dealers within so interstate the jharkhand which includes includes materials worth 2 lakh purchase from mr krishna a registered person who is paying tax under composition scheme so 2 lakh is from a uh, supplier paying tax under composition scheme and uh, uh, in respect of this the itc will be blocked because the tax is paid on the goods under composition scheme so itc will be eligible on the balance of 5 lakh on which the rate on raw material is given to be 6% 6% and 12% so but before doing this we need to also look at the opening balances which is given as 20000 5000 and 95000 so 
in the statement of eligible ITC, we put these opening balances. Then in respect of purchase of raw material, excluding purchase from Krishna as taxes paid under composition scheme. So balance is 5 lakh on which uh, the rate is 6% and consequently CGST and SGST paid is added to the statement of eligible ITC. Next, we are told that there is a bus purchased from a registered dealer in Tata Nagar, Jharkhand. So it's intrastate and bus is used to ferry its 25 workers to and from the factory 12% and rate of GST is given as 14%, 14% and 28%. Now, since this is a bus with seating capacity greater than 13, including driver, ITC is not blocked, so ITC is eligible and uh, at the rate of 14%, it's 168,000 and 168,000 and therefore the total ITC eligible is IGST of 95,000, CGST of 2,18,000, SGST of 2,3,000. Now we come back to the above table and total output tax liability is 90,000, 2,16 and 2,16. First of all, ITC of IGST is utilized towards payment of IGST and then for payment of CGST or SGST in any order and any proportion. Therefore, we utilize the ITC of IGST of 90,000 first towards IGST and the balance of 5,000 towards SGST. And this is what we need to do in order to minimize the tax outgo in cash. So this is the balance. Next, ITC of CGST is utilized towards payment of CGST. So, ITC balance is 2,18,000. So, full utilization and the balance of 2,000 is to be carried forward. And balance of SGST remains at 2,11,000 and ITC of 2,3,000 is adjusted here. And then this is the balance of 8,000, which is the net minimum GST payable in cash. So the answer is 8,000 of SGST to be paid in cash with 2,000 of ITC of CGST to be carried forward. Next question, number 6a. XYZ Private Limited provided the following particulars relating to goods sold by it to ABC Private Limited. And uh, in the question, we are asked to determine the value of taxable supply made by XYZ Private Limited under GST law. So first of all, list price of the goods and this is exclusive of taxes and discount and this is 50,000. So we add 50,000 here. Tax levied by the municipal authority on the sale of such goods and this is not included in the list price. So this is supposed to be included under section 15. One, so 6,000 we add. Packing charges are to be added and since these are not included in the list price 2500 is to be added subsidy received from an NGO and it's directly linked to the price and therefore it needs to be included in the value and it's already included in the list price so we need not make any further adjustment paid to one of vendors by ABC private limited in relation to the service provided by vendor to XYZ Private Limited. So this is a case where the liability is of uh, XYZ Private Limited, but the payment is made by the recipient and this needs to be included in the value. Since, since it's not included, it needs to be added. ABC Private Limited delayed the payment and paid rupees 5000, including GST of 18% as interest to XYZ Private Limited interest is to be added in the value and since this is inclusive of GST the amount needs to be netted off for GST and the amount therefore comes to 4237 totals to 64737 and then we see that XYZ private limited has offered 2% turnover discount on the list price after reviewing the performance of ABC private limited and the discount was not known at the time of supply so this is a post supply discount as was not known at the time of supply so it is not required to be excluded so no adjustment is required and therefore the value becomes 64737 so next question examine whether the following activities would amount to supply under GST law glory limited is engaged in manufacturing and selling of cosmetic products 
Seva Trust, a charitable organization, approached Glory Limited to provide financial assistance for its charitable activities. Glory Limited donated a sum of Rs. 2 lakh to Seva Trust with a condition that Seva Trust will place a hoarding at the entrance of the trust premises displaying picture of products sold by Glory Limited. Now in this case, it cannot be said that it is not a supply. It is a supply because there is a supply of service which is advertisement by the trust and there is a consideration in the form of donation although it is called as a donation but it is consideration for the advertisement services which are rendered so it cannot be said that there is no quid pro quo and therefore there is no consideration and therefore there is no supply there is quid pro quo and therefore there is consideration and there is a supply of service. Mr. Swami of Chennai is working as a manager with ABC Bank he consulted Messrs. Jacobs and Company of London and took its advice for buying a residential house in Mumbai and paid them consultancy fee of 200 UK pound for this import of service. So it's a case of import of service and if we look at the provisions regarding import of service under section 71b import of service for a consideration is a supply whether or not it is in the course of furtherance of business. So whether or not it is in the course of furtherance of business, in our case, it's for taking an advice for buying a residential house, but since there is a consideration involved, this transaction will be a supply. Let's move to question 7a. Mr. Zing Trans of Kolkata engaged in the trading of transmitters. On 20th May 2021, Mrs. Zing Trans have sent 500 units of transmitters for exhibition at Chennai on sale or return basis. Out of the set 500 units, 300 units have been sold on 28 July at the exhibition. Out of the remaining 200 units, 150 units have been brought back to Kolkata on 25th November and balance 50 units have neither been sold nor brought back. Explain the provisions under GST law relating to issue of invoices with exact dates on which tax invoices needs to be issued by Messrs. Zinc Trans. This is a case of goods being sent or taken on approval for sale of return and in such case tax invoice is to be issued before or at the time of the earlier of supply or six months from the date of removal in terms of section 31. Accordingly in our case the date of removal is uh, 20th May and 6 months from 20th May is 19th of November. So 500 units have been sent and out of these 300 units have been sold that means they have been supplied on 28th July. Therefore, the invoice needs to be issued on or before this date in respect of 300 units and 150 units have been brought back on 25th of November which is actually after this date and the balance 50 units have neither been sold nor brought back. So both for 150 and 50 units that means for 200 units the last date for issue of invoice is 19th November 2021. One consolidated e-way bill can be generated for multiple invoices. Comment on the validity of the above statement with reference to the GST law. So we need to note that after e-way bill has been generated, after e-way bill has been generated where multiple consignments are intended to be transported in one conveyance, the transporter may indicate the serial number of e-way bills generated in respect of each such consignment electronically on the common portal and then a consolidated e-way bill may be generated on the said common portal prior to the movement of goods. So basically consolidated e-way bill is a document containing the multiple e-way bills for multiple consignments being carried in one conveyance. That is the transporter carrying multiple consignments of various consigners and consignees in a single vehicle can generate and carry a single document consolidated e-way bill instead of carrying separate documents for each consignment in a conveyance. So 
this statement is not valid uh, <clears throat> this consolidated e way bill it's like a summary sheet without independent validity of its own so all taxpayers are required to file all taxpayers are required to file gs gstr1 only after the end of the current tax period comment on the validity of the above statement with reference to gst law so a taxpayer cannot file gstr1 before the end of the current tax period that means gstr1 is supposed to be filed after the end of the current tax period however it's not for all the cases following are the exceptions to this rule and there are two exceptions in the case of casual taxpayers after the close of their business and in case of cancellation of gstin of a normal taxpayer a taxpayer who has applied for cancellation of registration will be allowed to file gstr1 after confirming the receipt of the application so there are basically two exceptions so this uh, <clears throat> statement is uh, generally valid but not entirely uh, valid because there are two exception casual taxable person after closure of business and in case of cancellation of registration last question is question 8 part a under the gst law taxes on taxable services supplied by the central government or the state government to a business entity in india are payable by recipient of services that means the taxes are payable under the reverse charge mechanism by the recipient and not by the supplier being the government state the exceptions that means cases where tax will be paid by the central or state government under forward charge and not by the recipient under reverse charge so we will not go into the detail of the answer uh, this table will basically provide a snapshot and you need to write uh, the answer uh, with the appropriate description uh, so cases a and b pertain uh, where the recipient is the business entity and and uh, the black boxes basically represent the cases covered under reverse charge mechanism and uh, these cases which are marked as not exempt that means they are taxable and uh, they are not in the black box they basically represent the cases where the government is liable to pay tax under the forward charge mechanism because the reverse charge mechanism doesn't apply in these cases so these are services by the department of posts services in relation to an aircraft or a vessel transport of goods or passengers so basically these are the exceptions which you need to mention in the answer part b has uh, two options mr b a registered supplier of uttar pradesh is doing the trading of taxable goods he approaches you to understand the manner of utilization of available itc with reference to the provisions of payment of tax state the manner of utilization of itc under gst law so we have already uh, applied Uh, the manner of utilization of itc in uh, the first question of the indirect tax uh, section as we discussed above uh, and basically um, you already know the manner of order of utilization and this is as per sections 495 49a and 49b read with rule 88a and circular 98 oblic 17 oblic 2009 dash gst so this table basically summarizes the order and then uh, uh, it uh, could be good if uh, we give this particular table a kind of snapshot in our answer and then we follow up follow it up by the explanatory explanatory notes so we need not go into the into the detail of this answer because these are the provisions which are relevant and the only point is that it could be good if we give a snapshot as well as uh, our explanatory notes and lastly we are asked to state any five circumstances under which the proper officer can cancel the registration on his own under the cgst act so uh, section 29 is the relevant section in this respect and there are circumstances mentioned but you need to state only any of the five circumstances so this brings us uh, to the end of uh, this video and hope everything uh, is clear to you if you have any doubts or any clarification or if you want to ask anything feel free to write in the comments box and i will be more than happy to answer your questions and queries uh, so this brings us to the end of this video and all the best to you good luck thank you